So, first of all, I'm, I'm quickly trying to write a new book um, in the next few months. But kind of because there is no real news media, I don't actually get to have the time to sit down and write it because every time I try to write, some huge story breaks that requires someone who's not a total fake reporter to investigate. Um, but it happens to be, and Helen's mentioning Gush Katif, that um, on the chapter right now, finishing the chapter on Gaza, and I really, I remember it, it Helen, like it was yesterday, um, showing up, in fact, actually, because, because Ariel Sharon announced the Gaza withdrawal, that's why I first, as a reporter, decided to go uh, to the Middle East. And I lived originally in Jerusalem in 2005, but immediately got a place in Gush Katif. And I remember actually just the first night when I'm there, and I'm an American kid, just graduated from college, the concept of falling asleep and hearing a buzz above your uh, house and knowing that that's a rocket that can smash right through uh, your house at any moment didn't really set in until that first night, and I didn't really get too much sleep. Um, but I remember back then, after my initial experience in Gush Katif, I would run back to my friends in Tel Aviv and warn them, if Israel evacuates Gaza, Tel Aviv is eventually going to be hit by rockets. And back then, the concept of Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or central Israel or really anywhere outside of Gush Katif of Gaza being hit by rockets was so foreign that people thought I was an alarmist, a little bit more on the um, pessimistic side of things. Actually, there weren't even rockets back then in State Road. But I also, I remember, I was there throughout the entire expulsion of the Jews of Gush Katif, the entire time. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I lived in a beautiful tree-lined community called Gan Etal as a reporter there. Um, and then during the actual expulsion, moved to Nevek de Galim, which was the main uh, city there, the capital of Gush Katif. When people would think of Gush Katif, of Gaza, of settlements, of the concept of Jews living in this coastal enclave next to Gaza City and Khan Yunus, you have this image in your head, I'm sure, of you know, dilapidated homes falling apart. But actually, it was such a beautiful community, tree-lined, farming community, high-tech greenhouses. Um, I remember going through the greenhouses, and then, of course, after the expulsion, American do-gooders paid about $13 million to save those greenhouses for the Palestinians, and I think it was only a few hours before everything was picked through. And in total poetic injustice, I guess. Um, the metal from the greenhouses, of course, famously used, some of them reportedly, for Qassam rockets. In fact, actually, I, after the Gaza evacuation, because I was a reporter, I was allowed to stay there for a, a few hours after Neve Dekalim fell, after it was a total ghost town. And I strolled through the areas where I used to go to the cafe, or the restaurant, totally dead, and then I think it was two days later that Hamas announced that they were using the Vedek Aliyam as a training base to stage what would obviously be the war against Israel that everybody should have known would happen. And today, we don't even hear about Gush Katif. We don't talk about it, it's not even part of our conversation, it's not in the lexicon. It's as if it didn't even happen. And actually, it's critical to pay attention to Gush Katif because it is the shining example for exactly why not, never, in fact, to evacuate territory, ever. <laughs> I remember when Ariel Sharon was selling the Gaza evacuation as good for Israel's security. Can you imagine? <laughs> in fact, um, I remember Sharon getting up and making speeches to the to the uh, Israeli public and saying, well, if we evacuate the Gaza Strip and one missile or rocket flies out of here, 
Remember we said the world would understand if we would have to go in and take care of that. I mean, was anybody around just a few months ago, I was on the border, where you had the most obvious, morally clear, black and white conflict of on the one side, Hamas, a terror organization, using civilians as human shields. Hamas, a terror organization, announcing that their aim, their goal, openly, was to storm into Israel's border and murder Jews. They said it. And then you can actually see the video, the photos of the peaceful protesters um, with guns, with Molotov cocktails, firebombs. And then on the other hand, you had, the Isra uh, you had Israel that got out of Gaza in hopes of peace, in hopes of creating some sort of peaceful dynamic, simply defending against a march to destroy its borders. And yet, the entire news media, the fake news media, we saw how, I guess, Ariel Sharon's promise of the world understanding didn't come to fruition, and never will, actually. Israel needs to stop paying attention to what the rest of the world thinks. And start No, another thing, if you remember, and again, nobody likes to talk about Bush Gatif, but President Bush, at the time, this was another selling point for Ariel Sharon, he, he sent an official letter um, to Israel. It's on the White House website until today. This letter was supposed to define, in fact, enshrine American policy about future evacuations that in exchange for Israel getting out of the Gaza Strip, we got this letter in Israel that in the future, Israel would not be expected to evacuate most of, or part, that they would be able essentially to keep some parts of the West Bank as it's called Judea and Samaria. And then you had Barack Obama attempt to totally abrogate that letter, which was more than just you know a simple uh, a bunching of words on a piece of paper, it was a, a pledge. It was supposed to be American, an American promise. So even that kind of wasn't kept. And then I have to say, the American Jewish leadership, where were they on Gush Katif? Helen was there. Who are they? Who are, oh, okay, that's another story. Um, but, I mean, how could they, I mean, I guess you can't be more religious than the Pope, as they say, and the Israeli government was supporting it. But how can anybody in their right mind look at the evacuation of Gaza, just as if you go back, of course, to the Oslo Accords and to believe that Yasser Arafat, the godfather of modern-day terrorism, the guy who pioneered airplane hijackings, the guy who, don't forget, he called for, directly, the murder of three Americans, diplomats, in fact, in Khartoum in 1973, caught on tape, that we can turn him into a statesman. So all of these lessons really need to be kept in mind for where we are today. Now, normally, you know, I, people have actually complained about my radio show because it's on at night and they say that they can't fall asleep afterwards because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling the truth. I'm just saying it like it is. But actually, I have to say that for the first time in a long time, I actually have hope that things can be okay for Israel on all levels if we have Israeli leadership. Because here in America, we seem to have, thank God, American leadership. <laughs> American leadership that is clearly standing with Israel from start to finish, including on Iran, which I'm sure we're going to get to. And there's a lot of fake news about um, alarmism that Donald Trump somehow is going to sell out Israel and Iran when the evidence is literally the exact opposite. Um, but it, let's just take a look at the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and, and the presidency of Donald Trump today. What Trump so clearly represents is that he gets up there and says the emperor has no clothes. He says it not just like it is, but like we all recognize it to be. He's simply telling reality. He's saying fake news, fake news, and looking at the establishments, the political class, and telling it like it is. 
And I think it's high time for the Israeli government to do exactly the same. First of all, let's start with the two-state solution. It's a fiction. It doesn't exist. Its foundation is a bed of lies. So why continue to perpetuate it, especially now in the, during the presidency of Donald Trump? I mean, just think about it. To believe in the two-state solution, first of all, you have to believe that there's a partner for peace. That is the foundation. Now, in 2018, and certainly in this room, I'm not going to waste my breath telling you why Mahmoud Abbas and Fatah, and the entire Palestinian leadership that openly calls for the murder of Jews and destruction of Israel and has their entire media apparatus educate in violence and jihad and death, and Fatah's security forces are members of the Al-Aqsa Brigades, why they're not peace partners. I mean, if you believe that Mahmoud Abbas truly believes that he's a partner for peace, I don't know, call 911 because you're about to have a psychotic break. It's, there's no way to actually believe that, and you have to in order to go through with the so-called two-state solution. You know, another thing is the fake news term occupation. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about that. Occupation, occupation. First of all, there are legal arguments, and I have a whole chapter in the coming book, and they're out there. Um, for why, at the very most, legally, maybe, the United Nations can call it disputed territory. But we're talking here about Hebron, Shiloh, Eli, Beit El, as if there's no history there between after, before 1967. Yet even, by the way, Gaza, most people, I think maybe in this room, would be surprised to know that Jews have a long historic connection to Gaza. It's in the Bible, actually. It's in the Torah. The Talmudic period, actually, some of it unfolded in Gaza. Abraham first entered through Gaza. And then you have Kebron, where you don't have to go back to the Bible, just look to the period until 1928-29, to the Arab pogroms. Don't forget, Jews lived, in fact, Kebron, not Jerusalem, is the oldest continuous Jewish community in the world. And the only reason it stopped was because of the Arab murderers of Jews. The old city, Jews lived there historically. So there is no occupation, and I think the Israeli government really needs to get up and just like Donald Trump does, and not care about what the media says, not care about what the international community thinks, and tell these simple truths. Now there's the issue of refugees, quote unquote, refugees. Another transparent lie. Outright. I mean, do you know that every single refugee on the face of the earth, other than the Palestinians, are attended to by one UN agency for, uh, on the one hand, and then you have this one agency that totally changes the definition of what a refugee actually is. The United Nations of the world calls a refugee a first somebody who was forced to flee from their homes. The UN for Palestinians says forced to flee during this two-year period. That's it. So they could have come two years before, and probably a lot of fake refugees got in. Also, no other refugee on the face of the earth can pass their refugee status on to children, to grandchildren. And then you have the demographics, the numbers. A total, probably total fake news story. Actually, just a few months ago, Lebanon, the United Nations in Lebanon, counted the so-called Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, where we were told there were 500,000. And even that census came back with 250,000, half. And I can get into the whole um, shenanigans where the Palestinians inflated birth rates, deflated death rates, counted eastern sections of Jerusalem twice. But we need to call fake news on the issue of refugees. Um, now, the question, of course, becomes, if we don't push for this fictitious two-state solution, then, you know, what next? That's something that I want to have a conversation with you about. And I, I um, want to open it up, in fact, to questions on literally any topic. As I say on my radio show, any topic, fair game. Um, I'm reporting only today on the whole fake news Trump Tower meeting. That's something I can talk about for quite some time. Um, 
And I, I want to get into also the nation state law, so hopefully somebody will ask a question about that. Um, so let's start an actual dialogue. Every television station is total left wing propaganda. Why? I have been living there for 13 years, so. Oh, no, the Jerusalem Post isn't read in Israel, unfortunately. It's not in Hebrew, really, and nobody in Israel even heard of it. The Jerusalem Post is here. And then you have Arat Shava, of course, but most people in Israel also have, don't, don't read Arat Shava. I'm talking about the major media, Channel 2, Channel 10. There's a very, very small segment of the American Israeli population who would ever have heard of Hamadiyya. Uh, so, I'm talking about the major media as well, that like 95% of the, the public uh, listens to or reads or watches. But on the other hand, I have to say that even the left wing in Israel, my friends, I have a lot of friends, believe it or not, who um, are, are not politically the way that I am. And I've noticed a huge shift even in them. They understand, on the one hand, they want peace, absolutely, just as we do. Everybody in this room wants peace. Uh, by the way, there's a term that I can't stand because the left, if, if you want to call it that, the, the fake news elements, control the conversation to such an extent that even the most fundamental words like peace are defined by them because to them peace means land for peace, which of course translates ultimately in the murder of Jews and a war against Israel. They're the ones who make up that term, peace. If, if you want peace, you have to abide by the land for peace formula. Whereas to me, every single person in this room, I'm sure, I certainly want peace. Unfortunately, the two-state solution won't bring us to that. But the Israeli, the Israeli left, even in Tel Aviv, really has understood. In fact, they can see the writing on the walls. They want so-called peace, but they understand that Evacuating the West Bank simply won't bring us to that. Hi, yes. Uh, there is at least one organization in Israel, I forget the name, I think the main person there is Sherman. Uh, they have a theory called Jordan is Palestine. And I have read quite a bit about it, but it seems like a dream because they want to get rid of the king and they think all the Palestinians, quote unquote, so-called Palestinians, will move to what is today Jordan. Could you address that, please? Yeah, and also there are people who, uh, she asked um, about the, instead of a land for peace formula, some sort of formula where Jordan would essentially take over Judea and Samaria. So, okay, let's talk about that for a minute. First of all, the king will never allow that because he is a minority in his own country. And if Palestinians flood into Jordan, then it would change the demographics to such an extent that Jordan would be totally different. The king wouldn't allow it. Also, he doesn't want, in fact, Jordan relinquished full control of Judea and Samaria in the 1980s, late 1980s, to Yasser Arafat. Um, he doesn't want it. He has huge problems to deal with in his own country of Islamic extremism, and I don't think he wants to add to those problems by creating you know, a terror entity at his doorstep. But then there's the other element. Get rid of him. Yeah, but the, even if you get rid of him, then there's the other element. Is that justice, and is that going to bring peace if uh, still Israel would need to then evacuate Judea and Samaria and hand it to some sort of other element? And that there is no way that Israel can ever give up security control of the West Bank of Judea and Samaria. It cannot happen. Um, unless of course you have a But then, then there's the, the issue of Jordan itself, which is not exactly moderate. I mean, the Jordanians control the Temple Mount with the Palestinian Authority. Never forget that. And by the way, the WAF, the Islamic custodians, they're, they're controlled by Jordan. They are Jordan. Um, a lot of Jews even don't understand that the holiest site in Judaism is not the Western Wall. It's the Temple Mount. And because Jews and Christians can't essentially get up there and pray, the closest we can get is usually the Western Wall. And then Jews and Christians, non-Muslims, are allowed to go up to the Temple Mount for about two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. They can't pray, 
They can't bring holy objects, the holiest site in Judaism. And these rules enforced by Israel were actually imposed by Jordan and the Palestinian Authority, the Waqf, the same Waqf that erases Jewish history from the Temple Mount. So I wouldn't want Jordan to be in control one day of um, even the holy sites in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. They can't be trusted with that. Um, sure. I'm sorry, that's good. I'm not familiar with Martin Sherman's um, specific idea, but for the same reason, Jordan will not accept that. They're not going to allow the Palestinians ever to move there. Um, but for that reason, that Jordan, Jordan's uh, kingdom is threatened demographically because he is a minority. If you put a million, two million more Arabs, foreign Arabs into Jordan, so I don't think he would ever accept that, but that would be great. I mean, I would be all for that. Um, I also think, by the way, if you pay most, I think most Palestinians don't even want to stay there. If they're paid to leave, they might just do that. I don't know, um, but for all the money that the American Jewish community gives, they might want to look into something like that. No, okay, my turn. Hi, uh, I just listened this afternoon to Call Israel, which is the Israeli official bias. Hamas seems to answer to Iran, which means that even if there is a ceasefire, all Iran would have to do is, if, if they need it, turn Hamas on again. And I don't know that Hamas would abide by any ceasefire agreement, even if it might be in their interest, because they seem to be so compromised by the Iranians. Now, the Iranians are desperate. They're very desperate right now on all fronts. First of all, you have the nuclear accord that Barack Obama signed, devastating deal, that President Trump came, kept his promise, got America out of the nuclear deal first. Sanctions, crippling, truly. They're, they're not good for the Iranian economy, to put it mildly. And then third, Iran took a lot of its money and built its military infrastructure, quote unquote, in Syria. Now, Israel in the last few months has been devastating that military infrastructure massively. Um, there was one bombing raid, I think a month and a half ago, that targeted, I don't know the total number of sites, but it was the largest number of sites hit in Syria since 1973. Enormous, and Iran really felt that. So I think that Iran has been using Gaza as a bargaining chip in some sort of larger strategy with the United States and with Russia. And they're kind of using this rocket war, I believe, um, and using the border clashes in a larger, in the larger framework of reminding Israel and reminding Russia and reminding Donald Trump that they can, at any moment, turn the southern front of Israel on. So even if Israel signs a ceasefire, which will only give Iran more time to build itself up for the next war, Iran can at any moment tell them, we need you, turn on the war, and you know, the ceasefire with Hamas is ridiculous. So the answer to your question is, unfortunately, I don't think Israel will do it, what must be done. Well, what's your assessment of Netanyahu, and uh, who would you see uh, in his place? You know, on the one hand, I th I'll tell you. Question. He asked me for my assessment of Benjamin Netanyahu. And it, to make a long story short, I think that Bibi really was up against a rock and a hard place for eight years under the Obama administration. I think he should never have agreed to a settlement freeze, which is, by the way, racist. It's anti-Semitic. Um, Jews can't build in their own capital in eastern sections of Jerusalem. Really? Is that we call it settlement freeze? But when we take a step back, that's another um, coin that the left kind of framed the settlement freeze. What you're really saying is Jews can't build, whereas anyone who isn't a Jew living in a community that, that isn't Jewish can build in those same territories. But he agreed to that. Um, I think, bottom line, for eight years it was very difficult for BB to really um, do much. And I think that he did a good job during the eight years of Obama at just doing nothing. And given what we had before with Ehud Omar, who was a disaster and a sellout, and Ehud Barak before that, I think BB doing nothing is better than BB doing something. So I'm glad that for eight years he did very little. 
on the Israeli-Palestinian front. And on the Iranian front, it wasn't really his fault. He was so, I think, constrained. But the question becomes now, Donald Trump, I think, will, do you remember when he first came to office, I think it was the first week or two, um, or three, and he said at that press conference with Bibi, one state solution, two state solutions, three state solutions, whatever you want. Bibi should have gotten, flown back to Israel and the next day proposed a one state solution. So now under the Trump administration, I think that Bibi is doing a decent job. I mean, look at Jerusalem, it was recognized. And I think next they should recognize officially the annexation of the Golan Heights because yeah. So I would say like, let, let's give Bibi more time and see what he does. Uh, now, another aspect of this is, uh, of course, is there another Israeli leader other than Bibi? And there, I, I don't, I know most of them, and I'm not really sure what the answer is to that at this point. Um, right? So that, that's basically where I, I, BB fits into all of this, I think. And by the way, quickly, the, the United States peace plan, quote unquote, that will be unveiled, they say, in the next month, two months. I'm not afraid of that, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, Abbas has nothing to do with it. He has told the White House he wants no part of it. There's no question he's going to immediately reject it. And I actually think, although I would rather this not be part of the conversation if the peace plan is a, a still furthering the two-state solution, I think some good can actually come of it, and I'll tell you why. I think the UAE, Qatar, the Saudis want normalization with Israel. They're already inching closer to that on so many levels. And not just because uh, the, Arab, the Sunni Arab world is united against Iran. There are also so many other issues here. I mean, they're running out of oil. They need Israeli high tech. Israel can get in there and reform the economies of a lot of these Sunni Arab nations, and they know that. So I think that this peace plan could be used for the Saudis and the UAE and the Qataris and Kuwait and everybody else to say, hey, accept, accept. Of course, the Palestinians will reject, and unfortunately, they will probably launch the usual violence, AKA intifada of terrorism against Israel that they do every single time Israel and the international community proposes a peace plan. But I think at the end of the day, that can then be used as the excuse by the Arab countries to say, we told you to accept, you didn't. We're moving on slowly and we're going to begin normalization with Israel. So that's the good that can come out of it. Um, I'll take um, two more questions. Aaron, my name is Shannon Taylor. We did Joey Reynolds' show together years ago, your first oh. bestseller. And you're interviewing Jackie Mason regularly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's on my show actually every month, once a month. And he, he's a wise choice, a brilliant choice on your part. You. you mentioned that never again should land be surrendered. The origin of never again, which is Rabbi Mayor Kahan. And he took it from Yabotinsky. Yabotinsky took it from Bar Kokhba. And there is a lineage. Now, I have only one simple question. How can such a lineage, but never again, clearly associated with Rabbi Kahana and Yabotinsky and Bar Kokhba, become associated with every anti-Israel force there is? <laughs> I'm trying to understand the question, but um, what's the question? How can never again become a well? I, I think I understand that what you're asking is how can the left hijack the phrase never again? Um, here's the thing: the left is brilliant at, at let's even put Israel aside for a minute. The pro I don't even want to call the left liberals because. I'm a liberal, if you think about it, and I think everybody in this room is a liberal. We stand for democracy. We stand for freedom of speech. The left, quote unquote, the progressive left, is something very different. And they are brilliant at public relations and marketing. Um, I wrote several books into just that, actually. One, one I think, with like 600. 600 pages red army that didn't really sell because it was more like a, a dictionary of the left. But they specialize in deceptive marketing. And here's the conundrum for the right. 
for you know the real liberals. Um, we're not deceptive. We're not sneaky. It, it would be very easy to sort of copy the template of the progressive left of lies and deception and bring it to the right. And actually, the other problem, by the way, is that on the one hand, the progressive left is totally united or largely united. They constantly coordinate. I mean, you can see talking points. It's, I don't know who issues these talking points and whether they just randomly all think of them or not. But constantly, every single day, parroted back in the media, there's, what's the difference between the Washington Post, the New York Times, CBS, ABC, NBC, CNN? Nothing. It's, it's the exact same phraseology. It's the same titles. It's the same talking points. Whereas conservatives kind of don't get along to, and I know all of the top radio hosts and television hosts, and I'm not going to name any names, but let me just say that. Everybody hates everybody. I'll turn a lot of them. Um, and that's a big problem. There's no coordination or very little on the side that tells the truth. But on the other hand, we have the truth on our side. And so I think that's why more and more people are seeing that. And I think that accounts a lot for Donald Trump's victory. Um, last question. Um, over the last over the last few years, we used to, we used to have that in, the, that in America we had the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. If both parties were, and, and many areas were similar, and they only really differed in degrees on how they, in what they believed in. They were both pro democracy. Then, you, in the last few years, the left has moved radically towards the left in terms of uh, borders. Should nation states should they be legal? Should they be viable? And it made it more difficult in America for the two-party system for both parties to support Israel. How do you see that happening now that you have a, such a large percentage of the United States and indeed of the world's leftist uh, community moving in areas that aren't just anti-Israel in particular, but anti, but anti the whole idea of a state? So you're, you're talking about nationalism on the Democrat and Republican side, and sort of how nationalism has been framed in such a way that eventually it became anti-Israel. Yeah. Um, before I just want to talk about the Republican Party and the Democrat Party for a minute. Um, to me, and I think we we saw this with the election of um, Donald Trump. We always thought that there were these two parties, the Democrat Party that stood for certain things and then the Republican Party that stood for other things. And what we've learned, look at the immigration reform debate, for example. Um, there was the Gang of Eight bill that was put out um, during the Obama administration by four Democrats, four Republicans. It was a thousand pages. I read every single page, actually, reported on it. and was scandalized by the total sellout by the Republicans on the issue of immigration. Um, and that gets to the larger problem of money, of um, campaign finance laws, and, and who is paying for both the Democrats and some Republicans, and why are there, at the end of the day, so few differences, and why, when Donald Trump is so clearly working um, to make America great again, not to sound cliche, are Republicans not running on his winning platform. Why are Republicans running? The midterms, make no mistake about it, are critical for the continuation of the presidency of Donald Trump. The midterms are not about only local issues. Um, number one, if the Democrats take, and I don't know who in here, this is the Upper East Side, so it's sacrosanct to talk like this, but I'm surprised I'm not stoned already um, for you know talk, talking about support of Trump on the Upper East Side. But if in the midterms the Democrats win, number one, Trump could be impeached. Technically, there could be a movement toward impeachment. But number two, his policies will be massively stalled, and those policies are what the American public, on the left and the right, seem to want. And so I think if Republicans in the midterms simply run on Trump's winning agenda, then they would probably sweep. And on the other hand, by the way, I don't know how, let's see how real this blue wave is. Um, although, I guess in the last 24 hours, we saw it's kind of, it could be real. So let's see. We saw a lot of fake news in 2016 about um, us being told that Donald, there was no electoral map for Donald Trump to win. It was impossible, um, and that wasn't true. But, you know, to me, the issue of Israel 
is very, very concerning. First on the Democrat Party, the way that the Democrat Party, Democrat leadership, unfortunately seem to somehow orient themselves now almost openly, some of them in the direction of the Democrat Socialists of America, Alexandria Cortez. Um, style, Bernie Sanders style. You have Kirsten Gillibrand here in New York, um, who used to support gun rights, believe it or not, do you know that? And you know now she opposes. Um, I don't know what she really believes, but the fact that Democrat senators and congressmen think that they need to orient themselves so far to the left in order to win scares me, and part of that is where the anti-Israel elements come in, unfortunately. We had Cory Booker, um, did you see that picture of him just a few days ago holding the sign um, about walls in Palestine? Uh, and then, by the way, did you see the, the girl in the t-shirt? It said um, something like queer justice uh, Palestine. Now, first of all, if she would go and to go hold the gay pride march in Gaza City and see what happens to you, come on, really? Israel is the only country in the Middle East where gays and lesbians can live openly, where everybody has equal rights, and so the left is so hypocritical here and suicidal. Um, now on the Republican side, I, I'm not so sure that I see so many anti-Israel elements on the Republican side. I mean, I see, in fact, when Trump or if I go to a Republican event, when anybody talks about the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, it actually gets the biggest applause of the night. Um, the American public supports it. I'm more concerned with anti-Israel elements on, on the Democratic side um, than the Republican side, although there are some problems here and there um, with support for that Rand or Blue deal from the Republican side, certain people who sold out. Um, anyway, thank you very much.